states are lining up to get their share of a massive nationwide opioid settlement, $12 billion. But not Colorado. Democratic Attorney General Phil Weiser is taking a chance that by holding out of a multi-state settlement, he can get us even more money. Arnusha Roy asked him about that strategy. There's a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of frustration that people have been able to make money while other people's lives and families are being destroyed. So what is the state's position right now with this bankruptcy? We believe that the settlement that Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family are seeking to cram down on other states is inadequate. The big issue is how much money Colorado should get. Under the proposal they've put forward, there are too many questions, too much uncertainty. So in a release from Purdue, they said the money would go towards treatment, antidotes for overdoses, and that the settlement structure had an estimated to provide more than $10 million. So is that not enough then? That's incorrect. The $10 billion number is based on a set of, I believe, unrealistic assumptions. It is more like $10 billion question mark. The real question is, what about these Sackler family members who've made billions of dollars over the years that's come out of the company, will they be held accountable? Is there the risk of if you continue to negotiate with Purdue and they do go into bankruptcy that we wouldn't get even as much money as might be on the table now? I believe it's a very small risk on the downside. There is a risk they could try to cram down this proposal. I don't believe that's likely to happen. What's more likely to happen is the Sacklers will face more legal liability and oversight. Is there any sense of this would also be publicity for the AG's office or showing your posturing on a very important issue? I don't care about the publicity of, on this. I care about getting results. We here in Colorado are suffering. I've traveled around our state. We've had more overdose deaths, overdose deaths. We've had more people serving time in jail and prison. We've had more people, lives destroyed. We need justice. So like you heard, Weiser's very interested in going after the Sackler family, but a judge still has to decide if those lawsuits would even hold up if bankruptcy is finalized. I do want to make sure that to point out that more than 20 states have signed on to this settlement. That includes in Texas. The attorney general there said that he wanted the company's money to go towards helping people suffering from addiction instead of spending that money in court, Kyle. And that's the way the Purdue Farmers lawyers position it as well as, well, we can spend hundreds of millions of dollars fighting this in court, yeah. or you can just take our money. I mean, Colorado's got to be spending some money on this as well if they want to keep fighting. Yeah, so we were trying to figure out how much that's costing tax dollars right now. And so what the attorney general said is that they're trying to be as efficient as possible, but they couldn't get us a ballpark number even today. So hopefully we'll get that and be able to pass that along. We have shows on all week, Anusha, so they exactly. can get us that number Plenty anytime. of opportunity. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Colorado is America's teenage vaping capital. Quite the distinction, right? Twice the national average, though. So that leaves doctors and families and schools trying to figure out how to stop kids from vaping. A small school district on the plains is sending a message by making athletes who vaped forfeit a game. This is the girls volleyball team in the Crowley County School District. School leaders and the coach decided that they would not let the team take the court against Rocky Ford last week because players broke school ru rules about vaping. After talking to a number of kids, boys and girls, athletes and non-athletes, we're just kind of seeing a, a trend towards this almost an acceptance within the student body of vaping. We're not trying to jump on the, you know, vaping bandwagon. We understand the dangers of it, but I feel as an administrative team and as a community, we would take this stance no matter what the infraction was, alcohol, you know, drugs, whatever it may be. School leaders told us they felt like they received a lot of community support for that decision and the girls volleyball team will be back on the court to play Eads tomorrow. Democratic, State is Democratic Senate candidates are headed for the exits. They're making room for former Governor John Hickenlooper in that race. But now, inexplicably, somebody new is entering the race today, a name mostly known in the business community and not much outside it. Denise Burgess, who owns Burgess Construction and Engineering Services in Denver, told me today that she's not concerned about what other people in the race are doing. She said the Democrats running were talking too much about beating Republican Senator Cory Gardner and talking too little about issues like affordable health care. On that, she told me that she opposes Medicare for all, but does support a public option. She outlined a strategy to raise about $100,000, pretty bare bones campaign, and try to collect signatures to get on the ballot. Senate candidate Andrew Romanoff is not getting the message. That message from National Democrats is that former Governor Hickenlooper is their choice for the nomination. Yet while other top-tier candidates drop out to make room for Hickenlooper, Romanoff remains. 
trying to position himself as the progressive who will act boldly on climate change. We disagree strongly on a set of issues, as you know, because you've had us both on. I support a plan called Medicare for All. The governor does not. I support the Green New Deal. The governor does not. I support a whole set of progressive priorities, which the governor, unfortunately, has uh, made akin to Karl Marx or Joseph Stalin. Uh, I'm a Romanov, no relation to the ro royal family, but that's a pretty painful reference. And, and look, if you say, as John did, that uh, you don't want the job and you wouldn't be good at it, then Coloradans should take you at your word. You ever change your mind about a job? Of course. I mean, is he not entitled to do the same? Of course. So, okay. So you don't hold it against him that he said that he didn't want the job and wouldn't be good. I happen to believe him. Understood. Would you stay in this primary just to make a point? No. No, I'm running to win. Uh, look, I believe that Coloradans are struggling and suffering. I've met too many families who have lost their loved ones on account of problems that we can fix. I bring to this race both a set of legislative skills as one of the best legislative leaders in America. Politics doesn't reward modesty, so I want to work that into our conversation, but also a sense of urgency. Uh, I think the time has run out for incremental reform. Maybe if we were starting this debate, for example, on the climate crisis 20 years ago, we could afford the baby steps that some candidates are proposing. But it's too late for that. If you're serious about addressing this crisis, uh, you need to stand up and speak out, even if it's not popular with your own party. And to be clear, it's not. The leaders of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, who have made a different choice in this race, as you know, are not keen on candidacies like mine because we represent a threat to the status quo and to the special interests that are bankrolling that committee, like the fossil fuel companies. My full conversations with Romanoff, Hickenlooper, Senator Cory Gardner, and others in that race can all be found on the next YouTube channel. Colorado is getting rid of the QR codes, the scannable codes on our ballots. I had never noticed that those were on our ballots. But when you vote in person in Colorado, the voting machines print out your choices. They're embedded in that QR code, which is the, the barcode looking square there at the top. Each of your votes are embedded in that specific code. The Secretary of State's office says a human can't look at the QR code and verify that the choices are indeed the ones that the voter marked, so they're going to get rid of them. Even they acknowledge there's no evidence that the QR codes have ever caused a problem. This doesn't apply if you mail in your ballot. Maybe that's why we didn't notice. May I make a recommendation where we point you towards something that did not come from us but is worth your time. This recommendation is from next producer, Erica. She invites you to take a look at a Los Angeles Times article looking at the doctor, highly known for performing gender reassignment surgeries down in Trinidad. Dr. Stanley Byber performed an estimated 6,000 surgeries there over 41 years. That's how Trinidad became known as the sex change capital of the world. This Times article looks at his career there, the impact on Trinidad, his legacy in the years after his passing, and how his work relates to current issues. We have a link on the next Facebook page. This summer, History Colorado opened a new exhibit at the Trinidad History Museum, including a small tribute to the doctor. Heavy snow and a wet spring has not stopped some fires from starting up in Colorado in the waning days of summer, two of them over the weekend, and that makes four significant fires now burning in our state. One of them, the 6A fire, forced mandatory evacuations up near Bailey last night. Folks who are still out of their homes today. Our own curiosity leads to our next question, and it's about fire danger. You know, we had such a wet spring. Do we have a situation now where there was just all this brush growth that's dried out over the summer and now poses an above average fire danger? We took that question to meteorologist Becky Ditchfield. It's a complex situation. The dry days we've had over the summer did dry out that brush, which created a fire risk, but did not put us in a red flag warning or extreme fire danger. The risk comes from the brush still being able to catch fire. We're watching for strong wind gusts. Those could easily spread any fires that started and make them harder to control. But the wet spring also helps in these situations because it slows the burn and helps firefighters to get those fires under control more quickly. One of Denver's iconic buildings is getting some work. We've scoured museums, libraries, everything for historic photos. They really want to get this right and they could use your help. And everyone keeps talking about the Denver Bronco who gets called for holding. But what if they threw flags at your workplace? That's next.
there we kick off this new week with weather that is more mild than wild the high cloud deck keeping temperatures comfortable this afternoon above average again a trend that will continue all week long a couple of storm systems moving our way from the west and now hurricane Umberto, which is offshore from the Carolinas and should stay offshore we're tracking a little moisture coming in from the southwest so isolated showers west of the continental divide and one or two thunderstorms possible between Monument Hill and Yuma tonight the moisture is very limited but in any of the clouds that do pass by will be capable of wind and lightning. Fair skies and 59 in the city tonight. Tomorrow, partly cloudy and 85. Temperatures trend above the average of 79 until we hit the weekend, then feeling like fall. Mid 70s for Saturday and Sunday, with very little moisture for thunder showers this week. But there's just enough cloud cover out there to make for a beautiful sunrise and sunset, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. All right, so imagine if there was a referee where you worked, tossing a flag every time you did something against the rules. Hey, athletes just get paid a lot of money to have that work televised, right? And we do have to give credit to Broncos left tackle Garrett Bowles because he talked to reporters about his very miserable day at work on Sunday, all those flags. But now back to your workplace. What would the ref flag you for and the person who works next to you? Our Marshall Zellinger talked about that with a former Denver Bronco. Is there holding on every play in football? Every play, mostly by the defense. Spoken like a true offensive lineman, Super Bowl champion and former Denver Broncos lineman Ryan Harris. This is where I have to make a decision. I'm going to get a holding call or I'm going to replace and either hit the hip and move you out with this hand. He knows a thing or two about holding because he knew how to avoid it. I went through a whole year, 19 games without getting a holding call. Anytime the hands are outside, that's holding. Inside, you're pretty good. Why are we talking about a 10-yard penalty in football? I'll give you 72 guesses. Holding. Offense, number 72, holding offense. Well, the second holding penalty called. Holding offense. There it is, the bear hug. What you don't want to do is grab on the outside because you cannot materially, materially restrict or alter the path of the defender. This story isn't meant to bowl someone over. Consider it a quick education on a job most of us, me included, could not handle. But that happens when you get out of position. It's also a chance to reflect on our jobs. What do you do at your work that if you got caught, someone would call a penalty on you? Holding happens every day in a place like Nine News, in a place like wherever anybody works, whether it's not filling up the water in the Keurig when you're done, not refilling the Brita, or taking food of a coworker. I want you to be honest right now. Have you ever taken a coworker's food? Oh, we ran out of time. We couldn't get that answer there. Um, Kyle, is there a statute of limitations for what you're allowed to fess up about doing? <laughs> you want to come clean before you get flagged on stuff? I've printed, you know, like, I've, I've printed my tax returns at a previous place of business. Because <laughs> Did I didn't you have really? A print, I didn't have a printer at home. So Did I you stand up and, like, scramble over to go grab them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. I hope that that's not, well, that was somewhere else. That might, that might, be, a, that might be a flag. That uh, quick funny, uh, Ryan Harris says he avoided uh, being called holding 19 straight games because he played with the ref. Hey, ref, I'm thinking about being a ref after I'm done with this profession. And they're Did like, he really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, this guy really likes the rules. He understands. He's not going to hold. Oh, that's slick. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like, well, if we see Garrett Bowles talking to the ref next game, maybe he'll pull that trick. You know, find a little career after football. Thanks, Marshall. I hope that you had a good weekend. It was probably better than Garrett Bowles' weekend. The NFL leader in holding penalties had four more called on him Sunday. The Mile High crowd booed him mercilessly. I cracked some jokes. Maybe you did too. Here's the deal. For most people, your worst day at work is not going to be televised. For those of us who have signed up for a business like that, we get it is part of the deal. But there's also a difference between being bad at your job and being a bad guy. The NFL has both. And if you hold on to one thing as tightly as Bowles gripped Khalil Mack to keep him from the quarterback, hold on to this. Garrett Bowles is not a bad guy. He could have been. Raised around drugs and, and gangs and violence. He's struggling in school. He got kicked out of his house. But Garrett Bowles held on to hope of a better life, a happy home, professional success. He held on with such determination, he made it happen for himself. Garrett Bowles became a man of faith, a family man, a dad, a first-round NFL draft pick, a starting left tackle in the National Football League. Only the last of those things can ever be taken away from Garrett Bowles. It may be that he is not one of the 32 best left tackles in the world. So be it. 
That would not be the worst thing to ever happen to Garrett Bowles. Not even close. Away from the game of football, Garrett Bowles is holding on to what really matters. To preserve history, they must first figure out exactly what it looked like. The period of significance is really from the 30s to the 50s, but we'll take anything. The people restoring the historic Rossonian Hotel in Five Points could use your help to get a clearer picture. A bike, a convertible, and no bicycle rack. Making do with what he had is the most Colorado thing we saw today. That's next. When Five Points was the Harlem of the West, the Rossonian Hotel was the center of that action. Jazz greats like Duke Ellington and Billie Holiday came through those doors. Those doors closed in the 1960s. Soon to reopen though, looking as it did back then, if the people restoring the Rossonian can pull it off with a bit of help. Our Byron Reed has the story. When you're the crown jewel of a neighborhood, the building was built in 1912. Everyone knows a little bit about your past. The real significance was what happened here, is the, the jazz, the music, the people that played, they stayed here, and what it brought to the community. The Rossonian Hotel in Five Points was home to one of the most famous jazz clubs in the West. Billy Holiday, Cap Calloway, some of those individuals being able to play here and also stay here is just significant. To bring this back is gonna be one of the best projects that we're gonna do in our lifetime. Dan Crane is the owner and founder of Crane Architecture. His company is part of a group that wants to restore this 21,000 square foot building. It's gonna be Chauncey Billups restaurant. There's gonna be hotel rooms. There's gonna be a fourth floor lounge and there's gonna be a, a large jazz venue in the lower level. This building is on the National Register and from day one, the whole entire development team has said, we have to do this project right. And in order to do the project right, we've scoured museums, libraries. They need the community 
police help. Colors, interior materials, exterior materials. So they're asking for old photos of the hotel to be historically accurate in the renovation. The period of significance is really from the 30s to the 50s, but we'll take anything. As much information that we can have, it's going to help us make better decisions and the appropriate decisions to, um, you know, really tell the story of this building. The group says they hope to bring back the life and spirit of this building that's meant so much to the people of Five Points. This is for real, and I'm excited, of course, over the, my lifetime, I've never seen this place active. And also to be what it was, a hotel, a music venue, that is very special. For next, we all are excited to be a part of that. I'm Byron Reed. The group hopes to have that renovation finished by the end of the summer of 2022. So if you have any old photos of the hotel, you're asked to send a copy to Crane Architecture on Welton Street. We have proof that nothing can stand in the way of a ride. It's the most Colorado thing we've seen today. And some of your words about Garrett Bowles, next. The most Colorado thing we've seen today is a top down wheels up next for your case. He spotted a convertible with a middle bar converted into a bike rack up on Vail Pass. I like that. What a cool old convertible too. If you see something that says Colorado as much as this email it to next at 9news.com or give us a shout with the hashtag. Hey, next. Wynn says thanks for showing some sympathy for Garrett Bowles. We've all had fun with his holding issue, but he has overcome some serious hurdles in life. Chuck says we become so passionate, we sometimes lose sight of the people involved. Commentary was right on. He said we need to remember this applies to other situations as well. Isn't that the truth, Chuck? See you next time.